é proibido fumar. Respeite a capacidade máxima do local. Antes de começar o evento, por favor, localize os dispositivos de segurança. Em caso de emergência, mantenha calma. Identifique as saídas de emergência. E siga as orientações da nossa brigada. Opa! Nosso evento já vai começar. Muito obrigada pela sua presença. Ops! Por favor, não se esqueça de colocar o celular no modo silencioso. Pronto, agora sim. Até a próxima! Conheça a Casa Firjan. Cursos, exposições, tendência, tecnologia e inovação para a nova economia. Viva a transformação! Olá pessoal, boa noite, tudo bem? Sejam bem-vindos ao Aquário da Casa Firjan. É, só para ter uma ideia aqui, quem está aqui pela primeira vez, levanta a mão, por favor, para a gente ter uma ideia, mais ou menos metade. Legal, bom, então, é, para quem já esteve aqui muitas vezes, desculpa se a apresentação da casa foi um pouco repetitiva para vocês, mas é importante a gente falar né, um pouquinho, explicar o que é o espaço, o que é a casa. E antes, algumas informações básicas que tem aqui, né? A gente tem Wi-Fi, é, hashtag, que a gente sempre pede que vocês utilizem se forem postar coisas aqui da casa. E o Instagram, que é onde a gente compartilha bastante conteúdo que a gente julga relevante nesse cenário de nova economia. E onde a gente também mantém sempre atualizada, on time, né? Toda a, toda a programação da casa. Na verdade, eu vou fazer uma perguntinha antes. Todos sabem que o evento hoje é inglês, né? a palestra é em inglês. Se alguém precisar pegar o, o fone de tradução simultânea, está ali fora, então não sei se todos já pegaram. Se não pegaram ainda, podem ir lá. Bom, o que é a casa? Né? Qual é o propósito da Casa Firjan? A gente sempre brinca que não somos apenas um corpinho bonito. É um espaço maravilhoso, como vocês podem ver, mas é um espaço também comprometido em refletir e criar propostas e soluções para os desafios da nova economia. Uma economia cada vez mais digital, tecnológica... Alô, foi perfeito, obrigado. É uma nova economia, né? Como eu estava falando, cada vez mais digital, tecnológica e colaborativa, que a única certeza que a gente tem é a mudança. E aí a casa tem como missão ajudar as pessoas e as empresas nessa transição. E como é que a gente faz isso? Em cima de quatro programas principais. São eles o, o pensamento, né? o programa de pensamento, que é onde a gente se une com instituições que estão pensando no ambiente regulatório do Estado e para discutir políticas públicas que possam ajudar no desenvolvimento socioeconômico do Estado e do país também, né? do Rio de Janeiro e do Brasil. Depois a gente tem o programa Casa Aberta, que é onde a gente busca que vocês se apropriem do espaço e a gente trata temas que a gente julga importante dentro desse cenário de nova economia, mas de forma lúdica, de forma mais leve, de forma acessível para todas as idades, todas as classes. E um exemplo disso é a exposição que está acontecendo agora, né? a exposição Data Corpus, que está disponível aqui embaixo, está ocupando todo o jardim e a parte interna do prédio também. Vocês estão todos convidados para visitar. A gente fala do tema de dados agora, né? é, que é um tema que muita gente considera tecnológico, impessoal, mas na verdade é um tema absolutamente humano. E a gente traz essa premissa para a exposição, então se vocês quiserem visitar, fica aqui o convite. Depois a gente tem o nosso programa Lab de Tendências, que é dividido em duas partes. Né? A gente tem o farol dentro do Lab de Tendências, que é onde a gente procura identificar quais são as tecnologias e comportamentos emergentes e pós-emergentes que estão transformando a nossa forma de se relacionar entre si, com as pessoas, com a sociedade, com as empresas de um modo geral. E a partir disso a gente decupa isso e traz em forma de conteúdo, de palestras, de debates, que é o que está acontecendo aqui agora, né? que é o Aquário. E depois a gente aprofunda esses conteúdos no Lab de Inovação, em aula aberta, é, cursos, oficinas, etc. Então, só para tangibilizar um pouquinho, né, fazer, falar sobre a nossa programação aqui das próximas semanas, acho que todos devem ter é, visto que tem um folder também na, na cadeira, então se vocês quiserem levar depois para olhar com mais calma, só vou destacar aqui as próximas, 
é, as próximas programações. Temos o Marcelo Glazer, que infelizmente já está esgotado para o dia 9. É, depois, no dia 16, a gente fala sobre o futuro da publicidade, como desconstruir estereótipos negativos e acabar com a desigualdade de gênero, trazendo a Viviane Pepe, que é diretora global de criação, conteúdo e empoderamento da Avon, trazendo a Morena Mariá, que é uma afrofuturista, é, Luciana Santana, né, sócia diretora de Brand and Content da White, e Priscila Paranhos, da agência Flex. Aí a gente fala também no dia 23 sobre os caminhos da UX, né, que é User Experience, experiência do usuário, e no dia 30, novamente, né, essa temática de dados permeia sempre toda a programação da casa durante esse ciclo temático que a gente está passando agora. E a gente vai falar sobre ética e privacidade na era da hiperconectividade. Depois a aula aberta. A aula aberta é uma oportunidade que vocês têm para experienciar a nossa metodologia de ensino, né, então de forma gratuita, para vocês verem se vocês querem se inscrever depois nos cursos. E as oficinas que têm abertas é ferramentas para investigação com dados, design de dashboard, e os cursos que temos são Marketing Digital, Design Thinking, Gestão de Conteúdo Digital e Financiamento Coletivo. A gente tem o FabLab também aqui na casa, não sei se todos estão familiarizados com o conceito de FabLab, né? um laboratório de fabricação automática, laboratório de fabricação digital, onde com máquinas de impressão 3D, corte a laser, vocês podem experienciar, é, podem desenvolver ideias, produtos e jogar isso no mercado de uma forma mais autônoma, daí a, a chamada cultura maker, né? que está tão em alta hoje. E toda sexta-feira a gente abre gratuitamente para vocês experienciarem um pouquinho desses maquinários e conhecerem um pouquinho mais dessa cultura. E a partir daí, se quiserem depois alugar os, os maquinários né, por, por hora, enfim, tem diversas oportunidades também de desenvolver projetos em parceria com empresas. E um prêmio aqui que a gente está destacando também, a gente está com esse prêmio Casa Firjan, que é para premiar teses de mestrado e doutorado que falem sobre os temas de futuro do trabalho e reinvenção das empresas, estratégias de inovação, e estão elegíveis aí é, trabalhos feitos de 2016 até hoje. Então, se vocês tiverem algum trabalho de mestrado, doutorado, ou conhecerem alguém que tem, que possa se interessar, os prêmios vão, se não me engano, de 2 mil a 20 mil. É uma oportunidade super bacana e as inscrições estão abertas aí até 8 de setembro. Então, como eu falei, as inscrições podem ser feitas para a programação da casa no site, né, firjan.com.br barra casa firjan. E também no Instagram, a gente sempre posta tudo é, durante, né, on time, como eu falei antes. Então, vocês podem acompanhar lá também. A gente está aqui para falar sobre uma alternativa ao crescimento a qualquer custo. É, eu, particularmente, é, sou fã, eu terminei, consegui terminar de ler o livro dela ontem, é uma, um livro bastante especial. Então, eu vou introduzir a nossa palestrante de hoje. Lembrando que a gente vai ter depois é, um, um espaço do tempo também para venda dos livros e autógrafo. Então, depois, é, fiquem à vontade para permanecerem aqui na, na casa. Vai ser naquele espaço, espaço ali que a gente chama de Praça Elevada, né? ou Praça Amarela, como vocês preferirem. Então, se vocês me derem, me derem um segundinho para eu pegar minha cola aqui. É, vou chamar ela que é economista da Universidade de Oxford, onde é pesquisadora visitante sênior. Tem como foco de sua pesquisa os desafios sociais e ecológicos do século XXI. Também é associada sênior da Universidade de Cambridge e ao longo das duas últimas décadas trabalhou como pesquisadora sênior da Oxford. É, ela foi descrita pelo The Guardian como John Maynard Keynes do século XXI. É sucesso no TED, o seu TED tem mais de 1,6 milhões de exibições. E é o meu prazer de anunciar Kate Hayworth. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri, and thank you for inviting me here to Casa Vijan. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and really honored by this introduction. Yes, I'm going to talk about donuts. I'm going to talk about economics. And I'm really delighted to be talking about it here in this house of innovation because there's one thing that we need so much is innovation and reinventing the 21st century. And I think it begins with reinventing the economics from last century. So, growth at all costs. This becomes an ideology in many countries. And let's take a long look at the story of growth. Here we have data for growth, GDP growth globally from the beginning of the 20th century through to the end, through to where we are today, and then predictions forward, always growing. 
up, 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 off the screen. We know that economic growth has brought so many benefits to so many people. It's brought food, health, education, housing, opportunity that people never had before. And that is why it is so valued. But it also brings other things with it. Economic growth, especially this century, has become deeply divisive. The returns of growth are going into the hands of a 1% in many countries. It's also become deeply degenerative, running down the living planet on which all of our lives depend. So we've got a problem with growth. And our politicians know it. I've been listening for over a decade to the way that politicians talk about growth, because it's always the way they talk about the economy. It's always about growth. But because we have these problems, they add new adjectives to the way they describe the growth we want. I call it growth bingo. We listen for the words. We want sustainable growth, green growth, clean growth, smart growth, resilient growth, good growth, any kind of future you want, so long as you want growth. And yes, the faces of the politicians have changed, but still they call for growth. In fact, Trump doesn't even bother with any of the adjectives. He just wants growth. Four, five percent, if that's what we can have. These politicians with their empty hands, I look at them and I think, you are searching for a new compass that can guide us in the 21st century. We need to fill their hands with a vision of human well-being that is far richer than merely ever more growth. And we need to fill the hands not only of politicians, but of people who work with the economy. Because whether they're members of parliament sitting in a national or regional parliament, in boardrooms, in the media, growth is the main goal that we still hear for the economy. And the language of economics is so powerful. Even if you've never studied economics, it shapes the way you understand the economy because it's the way it's reported by journalists. It's the way we understand the world of business. It's the way our politicians talk about the future. Where do these ideas come from? They come from the way economics is taught. And I want to go to the fundamental ideas of the way that economics is taught in universities worldwide. Let me just ask a question. Put up your hand if you've ever studied any economics. Wow, great. And put up your hand if you have never studied economics and you can't quite believe that you've come to a talk with the word economics in the title. <laughs> a few people. We're going to make this talk work for everybody. So I believe that what is being taught in economics departments today is fundamentally out of date and is profoundly underserving the students in our universities worldwide because it is not equipping with them with the mindset that they deserve to have if they are going to take on the challenges that the 21st century brings. Here are some of the fathers, the founding fathers of economics. Milton Friedman, John Maynard Keynes, Simon Kuznets, John Stuart Mill, uh, sorry, that was Paul Samuelson, Milton Friedman, Adam Smith. They're all dead now. But they have more than that in common. They were all white. They were all men. They were all wealthy. And they all lived in countries that were empire countries. They all lived in countries that believed there was something more somewhere else. There was always somewhere to expand. And I believe these traits gave them a very particular view about the economy. And we need a far wider diversity of people thinking about the 21st century economy than this. The core ideas at the heart of 21st century, at the heart of economics still taught today, come from their thinking. 
And when economics professors say to me, come on, you're exaggerating, I say, okay, show me the first diagram you teach. Show me the biggest picture you have of the economy. And show me the portrait of humanity that you place at the heart of your theories. So, the first diagram that we teach. Economists in the room, anybody who studied, what is the first diagram you remember learning in economics? I can't hear you. Thank you, sir. It is the same answer the world over. Supply and demand. Welcome to economics. Here is supply and demand. Welcome to the market. It's a very strange thing to do on day one of economics, which means the art of household management, to immediately jump to the market and to immediately put price as the metric of value at the center of our vision. And anything that falls outside of the market contract is called an externality, which leaves us in the absurd position today that the death of the living world is called an environmental externality. To me, this is an alarm bell that starting with markets and defining everything around their absence is a completely out of date way of thinking because the threat of environmental breakdown is so central to our lives, it cannot be considered an externality. So we start with supply and demand. What about the biggest image? This is the biggest picture that is drawn of the economy and it was drawn by Paul Samuelson 70 years ago. And what we've got happening here is the essential market relationship between households and business. Households provide their labor and their capital. In return, they get wages and profit. They use it for consumer spending to buy goods and services. So the money goes round and round, and so do the resources. And yes, some of it comes off as savings that go into banks or taxes that go to government or spent on imports for trade. But look, the diagram tells us it comes back in. It is closed, a self-contained circular flow. This is a really important diagram for telling us that wages turn into spending, turn into somebody else's wages, and so a healthy economy has a circulation of income. But this is still the biggest picture that is drawn of the economy. And the silences, the blank spaces are extraordinary. It says nothing of the living world all the materials and the energy that are drawn daily into the economy and spewed out as waste and pollution. It says nothing of the unpaid caring economy, all the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising the children, doing it all again tomorrow, the traditional space of women's work, unpaid. It's completely missing from this imagined picture. And it says nothing of the commons, where people come together, not as the market, not as the state, but as a community, co-creating goods and services they value. If unpaid care, the living world, and the commons are missing from the biggest picture we have of the economy in the 21st century, this is not going to serve us well. What about the portrait of humanity? As you know, it is economic man. This is the model first taught to students of who we are. And his portrait is never actually drawn in the books. But because I think pictures are incredibly powerful, I decided to draw him. So he'd have to look something like this. He would be a man, no dependents, standing alone. He's got money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything. And the problem with this portrait of us is not just how narrow it is. The real problem of this portrait is what looking at him does to us. Because when we are told that he is like us, we actually become more like him. University students 
from year one to year two to year three of their studies say that they more value self-interest and competition over altruism and collaboration. So who we tell ourselves that we are shapes who we become. The portrait we make of ourselves matters profoundly because it changes us. What about the laws of motion that economics creates? The economists of the 1870s wanted to show that economics was a science, a credible science, so they looked to the great of science, Isaac Newton, who had found the physical laws of motion and become famous forever. And the economists, whether they realized it or not, began to try to show economic laws of motion. And I think there are three apparent economic laws of motion that have profoundly shaped all of our lives, even though they are not true. The first one is the idea about what happens to inequality in society, and it looks like this. In the 1950s, Simon Kuznets, a brilliant young American economist, took some data about the UK, Germany, and the US, and what happened to inequality in that country over time as the country got richer. And he plotted the data on the page. He said, I think I see a pattern that as economies get richer, first, inequality is increasing, but then it decreases. And the next thing he said was, I didn't expect to see this. I expected the rich to get richer, not the poor to catch up. He couldn't understand it. But by the time it got drawn on the page, this little upside down U shape, it was called the Kuznets curve. And suddenly it took on a life of its own. And it whispered out a very, very powerful message. If you care about inequality, don't try to redistribute. You see, you may slow down growth. And look, look, growth evens things up again. We have to go through a period of difficulty, but we will come out the other side all better off and more equal. And this is the promise of trickle-down economics. It's the promise of austerity economics. And it's not true. Thomas Piketty, in 2014, came back and he looked at this same data. And he plotted it on the page and he said, Kuznets was right. This is what the data showed. But he was measuring data at a very particular time in history, from before the wars until after World War II. And war destroys the capital of the wealthy, and after the wars, governments massively invested in public housing, public health, public education. So it was war and government intervention that bent this curve down. It was not the inherent workings of the market. But still, the belief and the message of this curve shapes policy in countries today, in your country, in my country. Its myth lives on. What about pollution? and the environment. In the 1990s, researchers started to look at the relationship between growth and pollution. They plotted it on a page. It looked so similar, they called it the environmental Kuznets curve. And they said, hey, if you care about the living planet, don't regulate industry. You see, you may stifle innovation and you may slow growth. And look, look, growth may initially lead to more pollution and more damage to the environment, but then it cleans up after itself. They admitted that they only had data on local air and local water pollutants, and they said, we don't have data on global impacts, so we don't know. But we have that data now. We're not in 1994, we're in 2019. We have the data, and this curve does not bend down. This curve keeps on rising with global greenhouse gas emissions, with global ecological footprints. Economies do not clean up after themselves. This is a myth. The idea of grow now, clean up later doesn't work. The planet cannot take it. 
So these were wonderful excuses for the last and final myth, the motion of the economy, which is the idea that growth is and can and will be endless, ever rising. And I will return to that at the end. Let me turn to one of these great dead white men because they were brilliant in their day and in their time. And John Maynard Keynes, I love this quote from him. Economics is the science of thinking in terms of models, yes, but it's joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world. And I profoundly believe that if Keynes were alive, if Smith, if Marx, if Mill, Milton Friedman, Paul Samuelson, if they were alive today in 2019, they would say, what? You are still using ideas that I had in 1848, in 1776? Do you have no ideas of your own? Have you looked out of the window? Have you noticed that the world you live in is completely different to the one I lived in? When Adam Smith was alive, there were one billion people on this planet. They would be the first to roll up their sleeves and redraw the theories and to come up with something relevant to our times. So I think we have to do this too. So I want to start economics again with a question that I was never even invited to ask in my four years of studying. What is the purpose of the economy? What's it for? I was never invited even to think about this. The purpose was almost given. It's to generate growth. And when we have growth, we tick the box. The policy has worked. So let's start again. And for this, I offer you a donut. I offer you the only donut that turns out to be good for us. But I know here in Brazil, you don't really like donuts, so let's call it a rosquinha. <laughs> and yes, I do know what that means, by the way. <laughs> so imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this picture. So the hole in the middle of the donut is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life without the food and water, healthcare, education, housing, energy, political voice, income that every person has a claim to. I crowdsourced these from the world's governments. They are the social priorities in the Sustainable Development Goals. So all the governments have already agreed that all the people in the world have a claim to meeting these needs. Leave nobody in the hole. Get everybody over the social foundation into the green ring. But, and this is the 21st century, but at the same time we cannot overshoot the outer ring because there we put so much pressure on this unique, delicately balanced living planet that we kick our planet out of balance and we cause climate breakdown and we cause catastrophic losses of species and ecosystems. These are the nine planetary boundaries recognized a decade ago by Earth system scientists. They are the life-supporting systems of our planet. And we need to live within them if we want to live well on this planet. So the aim is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And the first time I drew this picture, I was really interested in the impact of its shape. Because in the 20th century, the shape of progress was this ever rising line of growth that I showed you. But this completely changes the shape. It's balance, which we already know in our bodies is health. Health is balance. And then I looked at symbols from ancient cultures around the world. And they have the same sense of dynamic balance. The Maori Takarangi, the Zen Koan Ring, the Taoist Yin Yang, the Buddhist Endless Knot, the Celtic Double Spiral. All dynamic balance. There is something very wise to learn from ancient cultures about what well-being looks like. So if this is the goal, where are we now? This is where we are. It's not easy to look at because all of the red in this picture shows you how much we are falling short 
on meeting people's needs. Here, for example, this red wedge goes 11% of the way to the middle of the picture because 11% of people worldwide do not have enough food to eat every day. But there are people falling short on every one of these social dimensions here. 9% of people don't have access to clean water. One person in three worldwide doesn't have access to what we would call a toilet. So people are falling short on the essentials of life, even in 2019. And at the same time, we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate change, on biodiversity loss, on excessive fertilizer use here, nitrogen and phosphorus, on land conversion. So this is the state of humanity and our planetary home. Let me bring it home to you in some recent headlines. The UN say we need to halve our global carbon emissions by 2030. Since 1970, the year I was born, I will save you the maths, I am 48. Since 1970, the population of all other animals has fallen by 60%, while humans have doubled in size. We all have microplastics in our bodies. There's air pollution, land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus pollution, ocean acidification. And the richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth. Think about that. The richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth. How did we let it get to this? Growth does not even things up again after itself. It accumulates in few hands. If this feels a little bit heavy for a Wednesday night, here's one piece of good news. NASA says the hole in Earth's ozone layer is finally closing up because humans did something about it. And we can do something about all of this because all of this is due to human activity. In the words of the US writer William Burroughs, after taking one look at this planet, any visitor from out of space will say, I want to see the manager. <laughs> and we wonder who the manager is. In fact, I'm going to ask you right now, who is the manager? I'm going to stand here with my magic laser. I won't point a laser at you. My magic laser, as my fingers come across the top of your head, please shout out who you think the manager is. Are you ready? Here we go. Shout it out in any language you like. Shout it. The one percent. The one oh. Okay, I think I had us, the one percent president, politicians, fantastic. Okay. There are many managers and no managers. This is the problem, huh? So let's just think about governments, politicians, presidents for the moment. Researchers at Leeds University took the donut and they scaled it down for 150 countries. And I'm showing you just three in the Americas. So here we have Guatemala. The aim here is to fill the center of the circle in blue. Fill it all in blue. But don't go over the green ring, OK? So Guatemala has not gone over the green ring. They have not put too much pressure on the planet. But they're falling far, far short on meeting people's needs. And then over here, on a far higher income, the United States. They really should be meeting everybody's needs. This is a very low, global, basic level. Falling short on employment and inequality. But massively overshooting on those planetary boundaries. This is not just about resources consumed within the United States. It's about the materials inside laptops and phones and clothes that have come from all over the world. And here in the middle is your home, Brazil. Falling short and overshooting, double whammy. Let me put these now in context of 150 countries. So the place you want to be is that top left-hand corner. Meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. That's the sweet spot. And this is where everybody is. 
I say we are all developing countries now because there's not one single country here that can say we're developed. That was a 20th century idea and it was wrong. These countries are not developed. They are excessively using Earth's resources in a way that completely undermines prospects for other people. So we've got these ones we used to call developing, low-income countries, India, sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. They cannot just follow this old route. They need to bend this corner up in a way that's never been done before. It's never been done before. We're inventing this for the first time. And then where I live, and all of Europe, and America, and Canada, Japan, Australia, they're not developed either. They have to sustain high living standards, but move across here, coming back within planetary boundaries. And that's not been done before either. We are inventing this. And then the emerging economies, Brazil, China, Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Russia, Malaysia, Mexico, having to do both at the same time. We're on an unprecedented transformation this century. This really calls for new economics. It calls for humility in every nation and ambition like we've never seen before if we're going to make the possibility of meeting the needs of all people within the means of the planet. So what would be the first diagram to teach in economics? For me, never supply and demand. That's not going to get us here. I start with this diagram. I call it the embedded economy diagram. And from day one, we recognize that the economy is embedded in society. It's a social construct. We invented it embedded in the living world. It draws in materials and matter. It throws out waste. And it's bathed in a river of solar energy. Thank the Lord for the sun, because without the sun, nothing. But look inside the economy itself. We've got the market, yes, there you are, supply and demand, it's there. And the state. And the 20th century economics became obsessed with the battle between the market and the state. Laissez-faire capitalism, state-loving socialism, which side are you on? And in this battle, we lost sight of two other fundamental ways that we provision for our daily wants and needs. The household, where we all began this morning, caring for ourselves, our partners, our children, our parents, cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping. It's the essentials of life. But also here the commons, made famous by Eleanor Ostrom, the only woman to get a Nobel Prize in economics, recognizing that the commons where people come together, not through the market, not through the state, but as a community, creating Wikipedia on the World Wide Web, or creating a garden on the, on the empty lot on your neighborhood. The state has a key, crucial role here to balance, to rebalance the relationship between all these forms of provisioning. And then finance here should be in service to the economy. I think we've seen finance in service to itself. And it's time to redesign finance so that it is in service to the economy, in service to life. What does this mean for who we are? When economics begins with the market, it's no surprise that we show up as rational economic man, always shopping or working or shopping or working. But that's not all of who we are. If we bring in the, mar the household and the state and the commons, we switch from this very narrow self-interested me to the we. And then we realize we have many different roles that we enact every day in relation to the state. We're citizens. You may be a public servant, a voter, a protester, in the household, parent, or guardian, relative, or child, and in the commons, a co-creator, a sharer, a repairer, a steward. The values and skills that we need to do this well, and we have to do this well in the 21st century are so different from what we're told is valued over there. So I want to give you a tip. If you want to be good at the we, 
If you want to raise children who are good in these values and skills, I give you one piece of advice. Don't play Monopoly. <laughs> You know, this is a twisted version of a game that was invented to show us the evils of capitalism. It teaches you that you win by hoarding property and extracting rent until you are the only player left in the game. And when a child wins at Monopoly, people say, hey, you should go into business, as if that's what we want in business. So don't play Monopoly, play Pandemic. Anybody here ever played Pandemic? Yes, okay, there's some Pandemic in the room. Pandemic is a collaborative game. You play as a team. And it teaches you to win by collaborating with everybody to rid the world of disease until everyone is left in the game. This is the 21st century skill. When I play Pandemic with my family, with my 10-year-old children, I realize how unskilled we are at collaborating. And I ask myself, where was this in my education? I was never taught to collaborate. This is the most important skill we can develop. So, how can we bring ourselves into the donut? Don't believe the 20th century hype. Growth will not even things up again and end these inequalities. Growth will not clean things up again and bring us magically back within planetary boundaries. We have to find a different way. And I believe we have to replace these old myths with two dynamics that we pursue. We need to create economies that are regenerative and distributive by design. And I'll tell you what I mean by each of those. So this is the linear degenerative 20th century economy. And it looks like a piece of hosepipe, right? We take Earth's materials, we stuff them in the pipe, we make them into things we want, use it for a while, and then we throw it away. Take, make, use, lose. And it pushes us over planetary boundaries. This is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth's sources. This is what it looks like when we throw a waste again and again and again into Earth's sinks, plastics in lakes and rivers, electronics in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. I sincerely believe that your children and my children when they are the age that you are and I am today, they'll say to us, did that really happen? Did you know? Because they will see it as disgusting. They will know that this was disgusting. And by the time they are our age, we must have transformed this. We must bend those arrows around to create a circular economy where resources are used again and again and again, more carefully, more lovingly, more slowly, more collectively, allowing nature to regenerate herself, and then technical materials like this clicker, like these screens, the lights, all the synthetic materials in this room must be restored, repaired, reused, refurbished. It needs to be an economy that runs on sunlight, Waste from one process is food for the next. Modular by design and open. Let me show you three examples of companies that are beginning to put these ideas into practice. So in the slums of Kenya in Nairobi, one of the places where there were no toilets, now there are because this enterprise Sanergy has set up micro toilets throughout the community. So for the first time, people can use a toilet with dignity, Water, soap, cleanliness, it brings health to the community. The waste is collected every day and it's turned into organic fertilizer and reapplied to the soil. At the technical level, they're closing the loop of nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient use. At the community level, they're creating health and prosperity. Open Motors is a car company if you buy one of their cars, it arrives like this, like a wardrobe from Ikea, so good luck. <laughs> they say if you know what you're doing, you can put it together in one hour, like this. Because the design of this car is open source. 
It's on the internet for anybody to see how to assemble it and disassemble it and assemble it and disassemble it. It's modular by design. And once this chassis is made, then it can be customized for any place and use in the world, like an electric streetcar. They are making the beginnings of 21st century distributed manufacturing that's modular, so you replace just the piece that's broken. I'm sad to say if this clicker, something goes wrong, we can't replace the piece because it's not modular. The whole thing has to be thrown away. And then thirdly, moving from owning products to choosing services, we've all seen these kinds of bicycles popping up all over the world. But as well as the service bicycle, we need the infrastructure. And in China, they've built the world's longest elevated cycleway in Xiamen. And it goes underneath the motorway, so you even stay dry when it's raining. I would like that in England. These are companies that are beginning to put this circular economy into practice. But what about distributive design? Here, I think, is the biggest opportunity we face. And if I've shown you some challenging pictures this evening, this is the one that gives me the most hope. Because in the 20th century, well, every single product that's made, from my clothes to the clicker to your dinner, everything relies upon a source of energy, a means of production, communication, and knowledge. And in the 20th century, these were centralized by design. Energy from an oil rig. Lots of money coming together in one place to invest in a big fat oil rig or a coal mine. Production in a big factory where all the workers come in, earn a wage and leave at the end of the day. Communications, every telephone call last century went through a centralized switchboard and out the other side. And knowledge was controlled through patents and copyrights, intended to share, but actually end up used to protect and, and prevent innovators. 20th century centralizing technologies. Here is the beautiful news. This century, for the first time in human history, these technologies are asking to be distributive by design. Energy, it's a renewable network on the roof of buildings like this one and in this village in India. Production on top of a desk in a fab lab, like this 3D printer printing concrete, plastics, metals, ceramics. Communications, you've all got one in your hand or in your pocket. And this woman in a village in Tanzania has a node of the communications network. And knowledge, we've got open source Creative Commons licensing. Just think what is going to happen when we actually put these technologies together on the scale that's possible and start innovating this way. It's a complete revolution in how we make things. It's the beginning of what people call cosmo-local production. So this is the 20th century model I showed you. Take, make, use, lose. In a city, products come in and trash goes out. The cosmo-local vision of the world is that data comes in and data goes out but products stay. Here's why. Look at this chair. This chair is made of atoms. And atoms are really heavy, right? This is heavy. We should not be shipping this around the world. Atoms should stay local and be used again and again and again here. But bits, data, they can travel globally. So in this picture, if you can see here, it says, materials recirculate locally and information circulates globally on global data platforms. I think this is a vision of 21st century manufacturing, distributed. Atoms stay, data travels. What would it look like for this actually to exist in reality? It looks like this. It's a fab lab. There's one in this very building where all the machines and the connections and the open source connection to the world's knowledge based database is there. These fab labs are popping up. Here they are in Barcelona, Kamakura, right here in Rio, in Amsterdam, and they say we share the recipes of how to construct our world. We keep our own atoms, we share the recipes. 
If this looks like an opportunity only for well-off countries, I want you to remember, if you remember, if you were alive in the mid-1980s, the time when the only people who owned mobile phones looked like this, and the phones looked like that. And we would have said in the mid-1980s, what on earth does a mobile phone have to do with development? Who could ever own that? I think we are at the 1980s mobile phone moment with distributed production. But actually, it's popping up everywhere. In Bhutan, in Kerala, in Dar es Salaam, Lome, in Togo. I used to live in Tanzania, so I feel like I could chat to this boy and ask him what he's making. Look at this. This young man, who probably has not had much of an opportunity of education, because the state didn't give him one, and he definitely can't afford one from the private sector. He's jumping to the forefront of 21st century design, thanks to the Fab Lab, to the commons. This is an incredible opportunity to overcome decades, let's say centuries, of neglect of the human potential all over the world. This is where Fab Labs are now, and they're growing exponentially. They actually really are, right now, growing like this. What happens if that carries on? And to me, this is the opportunity. What would it take to harness the opportunity of this and to make this become distributive and regenerative as it has the potential to be? And I'm going to leave you with that question in your mind. So I believe to make ourselves have a chance of being regenerative and distributive by design, this will bring us back into the donut. It's the best chance we have. But I have to come back to growth because I left that hanging just like this picture. Here's the problem. Today we have economies that need to grow, whether or not it makes us thrive. We are structurally addicted to endless growth. We're financially addicted because financial system is set up to pursue the highest rate of return, putting pressure on companies to show every quarter they have increasing sales, increasing market share, increasing profits. We're politically addicted to growth. This photograph taken last week at the G20. No political leader wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if their country stops growing, while the rest keep going, they'll be booted out by the next emerging powerhouse. And we're socially addicted to growth, thanks to a century of consumerist propaganda that has taught us that we transform ourselves every time we buy something new. To me, overcoming these structural addictions to growth is the existential 21st century question. Because if you look to nature, this is how nature grows. Any ecologist, biologist, epidemiologist will tell you, yeah, everything in nature, it grows. Whoop. Things grow, and then they grow up, and then they mature, and that's when they thrive. But we've created economies that don't want to do that, that demand to grow exponentially forever. It's a flick of the wrist but a completely different dynamic. We need economies that make us thrive whether or not they grow. And today's low-income economies may be down here. And they desperately need economic growth to meet the needs of all people. And they need to do it in a way that's never been done before. But way up at the top of the curve, my home country, high-income countries, that have been growing and are damaging themselves and the rest of the world need to learn to thrive. So let me pull back and finish. I believe pictures are incredibly powerful. And these images that are still taught in universities, I know in this country, in my country, around the world, these are still taught to students. This mindset is damaging the potential of future economists and it is in no way equipping them to take on the challenges that we face in the world. They deserve to learn 21st century ideas. 
that place the economy within society, within the living world from day one, that recognize the we of humanity, not this narrow me, and that start with a goal, which is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. If you're interested in these ideas, I invite you to dive into the work of some of the people behind it. When I finish my book, I look back over whose ideas have most influenced me, and I was surprised and really pleased to realize that they were not all white dead men. There were some very clever white dead and alive men amongst them, but there were also women. Mariana Mazzucato, brilliant thinker about the role of the state. Elena Ostrom on the commons. Donella Meadows, mother of systems thinking. Janine Benyus, brilliant biomimicry thinker. But there were also men who were not from empire countries. Amartya Sen, son of India. He didn't start with supply and demand. He started by asking, why is there famine? Why do some people have no food? Harjun Chang, son of South Korea, when it was called a world nation when he was a boy, and over his life it became one of the richest countries in the world, using very different industrial and trade policies than the ones that mainstream theory tells us to use. This gives me hope because economics only becomes richer and better when a far more diverse group of people become economists and bring many, many richer perspectives because no one of us can see everything. We need our diversity to see all of the perspectives. So let me end there. If you're interested in the ideas of donut economics, I of course invite you to read this book and I'm delighted that it's just been published here by Zaha. And I invite you to look at these online animations. They're one minute long each. As you can see, they are silly, playful, funny, because I think it's time to make economics accessible to everybody. We all need to be part of the 21st century economic conversation. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. What, one and if anybody wants to ask some questions, I have no idea of the time. You need to tell me how long we've got. I think it's okay. Yeah. I'll put this on. If anyone has a question or a comment or a challenge, you're welcome to disagree. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Portuguese and English. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that politicians only think about growth. They will not uh, solve the problem. Um, I think that companies and our power of what the way we consume is, is some way. But how to, my question is, how to convince the companies that they must do that? How convince companies that they can have social value and economic value? Because they have to see the money. OK, I can do social envir environment things but I need to see the money. So convince and keep the social value and the economic value. It's a great question. Ooh, so many answers. There is social and economic and financial value in a regenerative distributive economy. Claudio sitting just here is creating recycled, reused products from waste because waste is food, waste is gold, waste is a resource that we can't afford to throw away. So when people transform their mindset and see the possibilities of waste everywhere, they start to see completely new business opportunities. But I want to say that it's sometimes the design of business that drives them always to pursue more money and more money. Because when companies are owned, for example, by shareholders, who put them under, or, or venture capital, who say, well, I invest in you, but I need my 15%. The climate may be collapsing, but I want my 15%. This is what drives companies to grow forever. And actually, many small and medium companies that are owned by a family, by, owned by an entrepreneur, they don't want to grow forever. They grow, and then they grow up, and they say, no, we're, we're happy with the size we are. We want to go home at the weekends and see our families, actually. 
So it's not business inherently that tries to grow forever. It's the model of ownership and therefore finance, finance, finance. It's the design of finance which pushes for this endless growth in the world of business. And that's why I said I think we need to redesign finance so that it allows companies to grow up and mature. And that is the biggest design, re redesign challenge we have this century, to redesign finance so it's compatible with life. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your inspiration. And I would like to know in that graphic you have, the biological um, boundaries, do you, do you include, I have a doubt, if you include like uh, the Brazil, Brazil is a, not oh, very going. good, um, mm. the US, the US uh, boundary. Um, the, the picture of America? No, not the America, the, 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 the blue uh, balls where you, where you talk about the biological, um, social yeah, the social values here and. Oh. Okay, this one. So the bi biophysical boundaries, do you include things that are made somewhere else, like the US, that blue, um, that blue ball? Do you include things that are done in other countries? That's this? exactly what this includes, yes. It Sorry does, if I wasn't yeah. clear enough. This is about a nation's, let me go back one. Uh, this is about a nation's consumption footprint. So it's not only, it's not measuring how many resources are mined and used and thrown away in the United States. It's measuring all the water and metals in the laptops used in the United States made in China. So it's a consumption-based footprint, yeah. Which is so important to consider, not only a production-based, yeah, exactly. Anybody, anybody disagree? I like, it's good to disagree. Uh, yeah. Here. Okay. Can we say that the uh, social development goals were based on the uh, dominant economics or the, which extent? The, the social the development. The uh, sustainable development sustainable, goals. Sustainable, sorry. Um, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, actually, in a way they are. I, the only other time I've been to Rio was in 2012. I, I first published this picture when I was working for Oxfam in February 2012. And the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, Rio Plus 20, was here in June. And I was invited by the government here, by the Ministry of Social Affairs, to present this at the conference. And that was actually fascinating to me, because if you look at all the words in this picture, they're all familiar. But when you draw them in circles like this, it changes something. That's the power of pictures. I was invited to present them here. And it was at the Rio Plus 20 conference that the world's governments first said, let's make a set of sustainable development goals. And they negotiated them through to 2015. I was told that in the final negotiations in New York in December 2015, in the late nights when they were, you know, arguing over commas and Somebody said to me, you know, we had a picture of the donut on the table because we used it to make sure that we kept our eye on the big picture and didn't get caught up in, uh, you know, the small things. So I was, as you can imagine, very honored that it had been sitting there on the table. So it influenced the Sustainable Development Goals. And then I redrew it. This is from 2017. And I put the Sustainable Development Goals in the middle so that when I present it to the world's governments, I can say, these are your values. I took them from you. And that's very powerful to echo it back to the government. It doesn't mean that they're correct. It includes gender equality. It doesn't include ethnic equality, for example. It doesn't talk about community or culture because it comes from human rights, which were stated very individually. And I think it understates the importance of collective well-being. But it resonates with the government. So yes, the Sustainable Development Goals and the donut, I say they are like cousins, very closely related. You were going to disagree. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really enjoyed a lot. Uh, most of uh, what you have said comes to me as something that is 
what you, we really need because our models the, uh, looks like they're not working very well for to this moment. But I guess that there is a little weak spot on your model that is the government. And uh, because uh, most of us, we are people, and I, I like more uh, Thomas Hobbes' view of, of the people. I don't agree that we, uh, I don't agree that we are uh, looking for the common goal and things like that. And uh, talking about that, don't you think that uh, if you, we put too much things over the government to the side, uh, it's incompatible with the, something that you are seeing that you need to be open. You need to be uh, uh, it's a, gonna be a, uh, a local economy going on, not a, something that's uh, central and managed and controlled over there. It's like a, a, a planning, all, everything is planning. There needs to be something that uh, takes, uh, it's more, uh, Easy going. Every everybody fits together. It's like that. Great. Okay. So Thomas Hobbes, he said, "Life is nasty, brutish, and short." Do you really agree? Uh, in part, yes. I do. <laughs> okay. I don't. And I think it's a. It, but but we can disagree on human nature. Do we think that we are essentially in competition or essentially collaborative? I think we're both. I have 10-year-old twins, a girl and a boy, every day. Sometimes collaboration when they play pandemic. Most of the time, competition. So I see it. I, I agree. It's in the human. But both of us is in them. We are the most social of all mammals. If, if cats and dogs shared and helped each other like we do, we would fill YouTube with videos of cats and dogs sharing like we do. We are, we are extraordinary, especially when it comes to sharing with people beyond our immediate family. We help strangers. So there's something deeply social about the human being, and we need to be recognized, we need to belong. So I don't agree with the Hobbesian view, but let me come to the picture that I think is useful for this, which is this one. Okay, so I had here the market, and the state, and the household, and the commons. And I think the 20th century got obsessed with the market and the state, and, and, this, uh, and people say, if you criticize the market, oh, you're a communist? Oh, you want state planning? That didn't go very well, as if there were only these two choices. I, I know you're not saying that, but this is how it was seen. Like, if you're not for the free market, you must want central planning. And what I want this to show is there are other options. And by the way, there's the commons. And when we have the technologies now, you see this amazing thing, we have the energy, the production, the communication, the knowledge systems that allow the commons to thrive in a way that was never possible before. Because centralized technologies cost a lot of money, only the state or a very big market could afford them. But now these decentralized technologies can be afforded by households, by communities. The commons has a chance that it never had before. To add one point, I think the state is actually a, a bit threatened by the power of the commons. Doesn't quite want to let go. People making their own electricity, I want to charge a tax on that. People sharing knowledge, we want the intellectual property. So there's a really interesting struggle to allow the commons to thrive. And of course we need to manage the state. That is why democracy is so important, right? So politics is inherently connected to economics. But I really don't want to go for the argument the state is always bad, let the market do it, because I think that's a disastrous route. So I'm not a Hobbesian. But I like this, I like this critique, and, and I hope this diagram invites this conversation in economics, which doesn't happen nearly often enough. The state is usually criticized and should only step in where the market fails. Mariana Matsukato points out that often the market fails to do what's needed, and the state has to have a vision. And that's why we need ambitious, visionary states that we can hold to account. How are we doing on time, Yuri? OK. Yes. Just one second, then I give you the microphone. 
So, I'm, I'm sorry. Where are you? Hi. Hi. Oh my God, I have so many questions. But, uh, can, can I say that maybe today uh, companies somehow are bigger and stronger than some governments, for example, yes. and like the 2010, no, no, Nokia had like 20% uh, of, of uh, the Nokia econo economics was the, the Finland. And, yes. Uh, also, because of that, maybe I could say that consumers are maybe more powerful than, than citizens. I don't know if that could be true or not, but uh, if I like, do you have any practical examples of converting traditional companies into the, this model? Uh, um, I, I mean, like, because companies are so important in the world in the way they produce and they discard and everything else, maybe we should begin to change for this model through them. So. I mean, so maybe they could start the change. So how can I start the change for this really big, uh, slow whales and are so powerful and have like so much power to uh, penetrate all around the world? I mean, like Coke can be in every house. So how can I go t to Coca-Cola and say, hey, let's change our models, like how to come I mean, like, how to convince them? Or I, th I think this, this was already asked, but do you have any practical cases that you, you, you did, like, find an argument that this could be changed? And what were these arguments? So, yes, we have to transform these companies. And I, I, I'm tending to think of two kinds of company. Some are, let's call, the 20th century corporation that was born, actually, to extract revenue and, and generate maximum finance. That was its purpose. And these need to transform. And that's difficult. Other companies are born into this new economy. You, you, there are social entrepreneurs all around here who create enterprises designed to bring humanity into this space. Some companies say to me, this donut, it's almost like our company logo. This is why we're in business, to bring about healthcare to produce organic food, to sequester carbon dioxide, to reforest the land. This is why we set up an enterprise. What is it that divides companies that actually are the old model extracting revenue and those that are bringing us in this space? And for me, the ultimate thing is not the design of the products, how the product is made, it's the design of the company itself. And, we, and yesterday I was here actually, we did a masterclass in looking at bringing business in the donut and we had about 20 people uh, sitting around tables discussing examples of companies and their own companies and I said to them, right, we're now going to look at the design of your company. So five design traits that determine what a company can be and do in the world. Number one, of course, is the purpose. What's the company for? What purpose are you serving in the world? Do you need to transform your purpose in order to transform your impact? Number two, your networks. How do you relate to your suppliers, to your customers, to your competitors, to your community, to your employees? Because how you relate to them and share your values with them is how you will hold yourself to those values. Surround yourself with people who share those new values. Number three, how you're governed. How are decisions made? Who is in the room? the principles, the rules, the practices, the culture of business, the metrics by which you judge your success. So those are the easy ones to change. Change your purpose, change your networks you move in, change the way you govern yourselves. Now the difficult ones. How is the company owned? Because whether a company is owned by its employees or its founding entrepreneur or venture capitalists or shareholders or the state, these very different design of ownership profoundly shape finance. We're back to finance. And the quality and the intention of the money that comes to that company. And whether the money says, I'm investing in you for the highest financial return in the shortest amount of time, or whether it says, I'm investing in you because I believe in the future that you are bringing about, 
the social and the environmental impacts. I want to be part of that. And I want a fair financial return, whatever fair is, big question. So for me, it's the design of those five traits that shapes what a company can be and do. And if a company wants to transform, it's one thing to talk about how the product is made, but it has to look at itself. And I've done this workshop with some major companies, um, Fortune 500 companies, and some very small startups, and it always reveals a fascinating conversation about the need to redesign itself in order to be transformative. I'll give you just one example of a company uh, that is, has been transformative, and it's a very well-known example. It's Interface Carpets. In 1994, it was just an ordinary carpet company making carpets. And then one day, a customer asked, what's your environmental policy? And the CEO, a man called Ray Anderson, he said, I was really embarrassed because we didn't have anything. Never thought about that. So he went away and he read and he watched films and he taught himself, he realized that what he was making was this. He was totally linear degenerative economy. He was wasting earth materials and he said it was like a, a stake through my heart when he realized and he said we have to make this a circular company. So he committed we will be 100% renewable energy by 2020. And in 1994, that sounded crazy. And he said, we will, waste will be food. Since 1996, they have had a 90% drop in waste. Today, they are raising their ambitions again. They've got big factories in New South Wales and Australia. And they looked at their factories and said, our factories are emitting carbon dioxide. They don't house any habitat. Let's look at the wild land next door, the forest. It sequesters carbon, it creates soil, it houses biodiversity, it cools the climate, and now they are going beyond zero harm to being generative like nature. So they're creating factories that cool the climate, that sequester carbon dioxide, that clean the water, clean the air. And to me, that is a remarkable company. Guess what? It was privately owned. You almost never will find an example of a company that's this visionary that's shareholder owned because the shareholding doesn't allow it. These companies tend to be privately owned, sometimes family owned, entrepreneur owned, and there's a story. There's a story that the entrepreneur has, and I always like asking them, what, why? And there's a personal moment when they had like the stake in the heart. So I think all of this change starts with individuals who just get the conviction and say, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to make this happen. So that gives me hope because I think it does come down to the individual changing. But we have to transform the business structures to make that possible as well. How are we doing, Yuri? Two, two more. Okay, one. Okay, hi. hi. Uh, thank you for your speech and your ideas that you shared with us here. But like, I really like what you tell us about. Speak up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I really like your idea about the growth when you talk about small companies, mm. like family-owned companies. Mm. But like for your donut economy you need to think also in terms of infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, you need to think in terms of water and sanitation, energy, tra transportation. Yes. And like this kind of, um, this kind of sector, it needs like, it's like, it's marked by natural monopolies that need higher investment. Okay, so, um, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Because I'm speaking a few. Your question <laughs> is brilliant and perfect. Uh, Don't be nervous. Keep going. So my point is, like, investing in infrastructure is a long-term investment. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, like, here in Brazil, most of the investment in infrastructure is made through treasury bonds. Okay. So, people won't invest in treasury bonds if they don't think that economy will grow. So, how can you? think on not having a long-term growth if the main driver of your donut economy, that is infrastructure, needs that long-term growth. 
this is my question. Thank you. Excellent question. So we, uh, it's part of the way in which we are structurally addicted to endless growth because of the way we finance pensions, not even just uh, treasury bonds. But government, it depends what we're investing in. If we're investing in infrastructure that actually allows us to transform, we can have that growth. I didn't say no growth. I said we need economies that make us thrive whether or not they grow, whether or not GDP is going up or down. If we're going to transform, for example, to a renewable energy economy, it is going to require investments in renewable energy. This will drive GDP up, for sure. But then once we've invested in those renewable energies, the cost of generating energy comes right down. And actually, you'll earn a lot less from it. So it's about allowing the path of GDP to no longer be the determinant that endlessly goes up. But you're talking about treasury bonds, which is a structure. The government needs to recoup the money to repay the bond. It's structurally dependent upon growth. I don't know the answer to this. All I know is that in nature, nothing grows forever. But we have created economies that expect, demand, and depend upon growing forever within a closed, delicately balanced living planet. And there's no example anywhere of that going well. When something within a system tries to grow forever, in our bodies we call it cancer. It tries to grow forever. It destroys the whole on which it depends. So I would come back around and say what we need to redesign is the finance. We need to redesign how we finance transformations. And I don't know the answer. I'm not going to pretend I do. But I know it's a question. And a qu you are such a clear, clear and well-structured question. I will hope someone like you is on the case about saying, actually, I need to be part of the team that redesigns finance to make it work, because at the moment it drives endless growth, and there's no example of that ending well. Hi, We've got Kate. time for one more question. This, sorry, this lady's got the microphone. We were colleagues at Schumacher College this year in January for the change in the frame. And it's lovely it's a, to see you again. Yes, as guest lecturer. I was wondering if you can push the boundaries a little bit here, beyond economies, about how arts, culture, biology, science, history can help us join efforts to change cultures, to change values that actually influence the whole new model we're trying to change, we're trying to influence. So just saying one thing, I'm not an economist. I work with museums and new economies. I work with regeneration arts and culture. And just listening when you were saying about the animation, uh, the videos, and the whole idea that the people who consume, the people who buy products, or the people who are working the companies right now, if they reframe their work, the way they think about society and the values that the histories that we were told, if we change that, perhaps in the long term range we are capable of changing the models that we value in economy and also in society development. So it's very important because here it's uh, also an arts and culture uh, space, not only in the economies, but there's an exhibition right here. And how we go beyond just the economical sector, environmental sector, to be able to do a big change. So I'm part of this, I am on board with you, but also think that it's important to, to expose a little bit and tell the framework, also at Schumacher College, they're developing this, to help other people from all the sectors to join efforts with economies to change this for good? A great question and very Schumacher question. I would have known you were from Schumacher if you hadn't even told me. How do we widen this from being an economic conversation to bring in the arts? So as I've said, for me, pictures are incredibly powerful and I discovered it when I first drew this donut diagram and suddenly was invited by the government of Brazil to present it. I was amazed. And it made me reflect on the power of pictures, which are art. When I first drew these diagrams, I realized these, are, these look like economic diagrams, but it's art. It makes choices about what it shows and what it leaves out, what it puts at the center and what it puts at the edges. And it frames the way we think. So pictures are incredibly powerful. Over half of the nerve fibers in our brains are linked to our eyesight. 
Our eyes are constantly looking for patterns. So when we find diagrams, they inform the way we understand the world. So for me, number one, pay great attention to the pictures that you draw and that you teach and that you use and that you allow to shape the way you see the world. Number two, pay great attention to the words you use. Developing countries and developed countries. To me, this language is gone because we need to reconceive of what we're doing. And the biggest metaphorical change that I think we need this century is moving from thinking that progress lies in endless growth to realizing that growth is a healthy phase of life, but actually progress for us now and health lies in balance. And we've got an amazing opportunity to understand this because that's what it is in our bodies. We all know that our body's health lies in balance. Have enough food, but not too much. Enough water, oxygen, exercise, heat. Have enough, but not too much of all of these things. We are balanced, delicately balanced beings, and that's what health is. If we can take that deep understanding from our bodies and take it to the planetary body and realize that the planetary body and our relationship to the rest of nature also lies in balance. And that, for me, is where the role of art comes in and making us understand it not just here in the brain, but in the heart, make us laugh in the belly, make us feel it. That's why I use toys, because our eyes, you know, we need to see this pattern. This is a 21st century pattern. And we need to make it everywhere. We need to make it in the renewable energy systems. We need to make it in the circular economy. We need to make it in the way we create uh, distributed income possibilities for people. This is the pattern we need to create. So to me, the role of art is huge to make this fun and intriguing and playful and beautiful. And that's why I ended with those videos. And I love working with artists to bring this to life. So that's a lovely point to end on, thank you. Let's turn this into art that makes it irresistible to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for such great conversation. Thank you. Hi. Is, is, are you gonna close, yes? Thank you. you. Okay, no, that's it, okay. Thank you. Take this off. So you have to. Pleasure, my pleasure. That was fun. Bom, pessoal, lembrando que tem autógrafo do livro lá na Praça Elevada, então fiquem todos à vontade para ficar aí. Você viu por que eu queria isso? Sim. Isso ainda faz diferença. Como foi o dia? Lovely.